numb and my heart's feeling heavy Got anxiety in my blood but I'm about to get ready To talk about it and ashamed of the way that my mind works Straight flexing like a nature Got a lot of things on my mind Got a lot of things to pursue Ain't no stigma gonna stop me from reaching my potential What a nice view Welcome to Talk Mental Health with Logan Noon. This is episode 42. Today I have on Dr. Anthony Lyons. He's my advisor at Pacific Northwest University and one of my favorite lecturers. Unfortunately, really the funniest comment of this entire episode happened before I press record because uh, I was talking to Dr. Lyons. I was like, hey, Dr. Lyons, this was really one of my favorite lectures that you gave last year. And he's like, oh, well, that's pretty easy, Logan, because you never go to lecture. Which is 100% true. I am sorry for any professors that I do offend, but I do watch all lectures from home on our little, uh, you know, tele lecture service. But sorry, I digress. Back to Dr. Lyons. So today, me and Dr. Lyons are going to be talking essentially about runner's high and how runner's high isn't really an endorphins reaction, or it partially is, but it has a lot to do with endocannabinoid receptors. So a little bit about Dr. Anthony Lyons. He earned his degree in biochemistry in 1998 and got his PhD in biochemistry from University of College Cork, Ireland in 2003. After he got his PhD, he worked at as a postdoctorate researcher in France and at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. A lot of his research has to do with neuroinflammatory changes and aging as well as neurodegenerative conditions. He received his prestigious Irish Health Research Board Fellowship. He's one of my favorite professors. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation, and thank you for tuning in. So, okay, so everyone thinks when we do, when we go out on a run, you hear runner's high, that it's automatically endorphins. Yeah. And I remember really the pivotal moment of this lecture last year that you gave, but that is, it's not. Uh, it's not, not. Okay. But it's most likely not. Okay, that that sounds a bit of a convoluted, but there has been studies done where they've actually blocked the endorphin receptors um, in mice, and they still experience runner's high. How did they test for runner's high in mice? They they look at uh, fear conditioning and anxiety, right? So, uh, do they still experience it? Yes, they do. So again, they essentially by blocking your endorphin receptors. Um, mice essentially still experience what you'd consider a runner's high or what we'd consider a runner's high. Mm -hmm. So the question then begs, what is it? So they followed that on and they found that it turns out to be endocannabinoids. Primarily, there's a few endocannabinoids, but primarily the biggest culprit is probably anandamide, um, which again is lipid soluble. It does cross the blood-brain barrier and is increased in response to exercise. And it's really easy to measure it. So and there's a link to other stuff as well in relation to that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but it, th that's not to say that endorphins aren't increased. The original research in relation to that was what they did was they took, I can't remember how many guys, I think the study was done in Germany, and they put them on a treadmill for two hours and they looked at pre and post. And, and what they found was that, yeah, endorphins in particular, one met in Keflin, actually increased quite dramatically. But the pace that these guys were running at was the equivalent of about 5.30 per mile. Mm -hmm. That's fast. Ex yeah, to be able, fast. To yeah. be able to maintain that for two hours, those guys are 2.30 marathoners. Like, that, that's incredibly swift. So you're talking international class athletes pushing themselves to what you'd consider to a fairly extreme level. So you, you do, and I, I have to say, again, this is what I mentioned to you before, that there is subtle differences to what you get as a runner's high so and it doesn't happen every time either i mean i'll go out for an hour a run and it may happen or it may not and you just feel kind of pretty happy after it yeah right? your focus is better that kind of stuff and i'd consider that kind of a runner's high whereas if you do and this is what's happened to me in the past if you do um high intensity interval training and again this doesn't happen all the time i used to do as i mentioned to you i used to row so we used to mm -hmm. do a lot of circuit training um, much higher intensity short burst stuff either in the boat or on the, on the ergometer and uh, yeah you'd get it after that where you're completely wiped but you're completely like whoo this is great yeah you know um, and that's a very different feeling to what you get from running for an hour and feeling oh I feel pretty good now you, yeah. know, you know that kind of feeling and I mean runners say I think people have tried to they've studied it and they want you have to go for longer than 20 minutes to 30 minutes 
like it, it'll be a 40 minutes mm -hmm. to an hour type effect um, but again it's not specific and it's hard to know somebody asked me last year is how is there a better time of the day to achieve this apparently the morning time is best yeah but some people are morning people some people are not so, so it kind of varies we're not on the I guess totally sure if all these benefits are necessarily from endocannabinoid receptors or endorphins but either way the kind of accepted benefits of exercise I remember you alluded to in the lecture last yep. year you talked about I think it was a group of children who were in like detention yeah and treadmills yeah to an extent yeah that was a good that was a fairly decent study this means that was based right that was kind of real real world scenario where uh -huh. they took problem children I suppose people who used to be in detention a lot um, this was done in Canada, but there's a similar study I think was done in Ina Indiana where they took a bunch of kids who were what you'd call problem children in school. I can't remember what grade. It was like seven to ninth. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, first thing in the morning, they put them on a treadmill for 20 minutes, half an hour. And what they found was that over the course of the year, literacy rates went up, uh, arithmetic um, level went up, uh, detentions went down, attention span went up. So yeah, there was a real world, obviously, benefit to it, and it mm -hmm. was seen on a day-to-day -day basis. That was based on research, I think, where they did acute bouts of exercise, and what they found is that if you do even a 10 to 15 minute acute bout of exercise, mm -hmm. it doesn't even have to be hugely intense. Like, for you guys between class, just walk around for 10 minutes, walk around the building for 10 minutes, and it tends to boost uh, attention span and memory retention for about 45 to 50 minutes. Apparently, that's what the research says. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I need to incorporate that better. But <laughs> one thing, I, I mean, what do you think about students who, uh, like, for instance, I go to the gym and I'll get on the elliptical and I'll be studying on the elliptical. Do you think, you know, is that helping me uh, improve my learning capability because it's exercise or is it not good because I'm not taking a break necessarily mm -hmm. and getting that flow state of mind that we're talking I, I about? I would think that it's probably, it's really up to you, to be honest. Mm -hmm. If you feel good that you're retaining stuff while you're on the elliptical, that's cool. If you'd like to do it, personally, I like to do it. If I go for a run, I tend not to use headphones or listen to anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's just your way to, I suppose, plug out um, and go for a reset. So it, it depends on the individual, I think. I, I think when you get to that state, I mean, if you're talking about memory retention and so on, I think post-exercise, you're probably going to get a better boost. Yeah. However, if you find that your focus is pretty decent during exercise, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I, 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 I'd encourage it. Yeah. You guys are stuck for time. I would go for as yeah, much time. Yeah, right, certainly. Yeah. Maybe once boards are over, I'll have a little bit more yeah, time exactly. to kind of fool around. But going back to kind of like your lecture, so now some of the uh, effects that we notice from this runner's high, whatever it may be is that it release, or reduces stress and pain yep. um, by interacting with opiate receptors. And is it both the endorphins and endocannabinoids that both interact no, with your endorphin, No, your, your endorphins are only going to interact with your opiate receptors. Okay. I, I'll okay. leave that for somebody else to talk about. Okay. Your endocannabinoids in particular, obviously, as I mentioned, anandamide is going to interact with CB1. But one of the biggest things with, endo, uh, with your endocannabinoids is that obviously they increase with exercise. That as a correlation also increases BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor okay, okay? and that's kind of your, your magic molecule in relation to memory executive function that kind of thing because it promotes neurogenesis okay so a lot of the studies I'll get a kind of bit of background on this a lot of the studies in relation to exercise and memory and function and stuff like that have derived from a more elderly population because obviously you've got a cognitive decline as you get older, you get neuronal loss as you get older and so on. So is there ways to, as a lifestyle intervention, to actually reverse that or to stop, halt it or to reverse it? And again, that's the reason why exercise, a lot of people have chosen exercise as an intervention model because it's free for, yeah. for one. Yeah. Right? So... Um, yeah, and it's found to be massively beneficial, but exercise also correlates with an increase in BDNF, which is, as I mentioned. So let's, uh, let's kind of pause there yep. because a lot of my listeners aren't medical students, and uh, although I am a second-year medical student, I still don't always remember these terms and everything. Okay, yeah, everything so, is uh, in medical <laughs> <Yeah>. school. <laughs> Endocannabinoid, we're not talking about cannabis that you smoke. This no, is no. Can, uh, kind of a 
I yeah, guess, how would you describe it? It's and an endogenous molecule that you produced. You have genes that. So even if you have never smoked marijuana or consumed nope, any marijuana in your life, this. you do have endocannabinoid yep. receptors in your body, kind of. Thing. Yep. And that's what I want to sort of make sure the listener really understands. So here's the thing. I mean, if you've got a receptor for something, right? So THC or CBD. Mm-hmm. If you've got a receptor for it, that means there's a ligand for it, or you have a molecule that binds onto it naturally within yourself. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in other words, it's your endogenous version. So in this case, an andamide being one of the endogenous molecules does increase in response to exercise. Okay. Mm-hmm. We can talk about the THC CBD thing in a minute. Mm-hmm. I'll I'll mention that briefly in relation to exercise because there's been a couple of studies done, but not a huge amount. Okay. It's it's technically on the banned substance list. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, Jeff Sessions. <sighs> but um. <laughs> no, but a, it's on the water banned substance list as well. Yeah. Yeah. So th- technically THC CBD is not. Mm-hmm. So again, I'll talk about that in a minute because it's become popular to take CBD supplementation in the endurance world. Okay. Um, so the anandamide is, you know, what we make endogenously, but yep. then it releases BDNF, which is, at least from your slideshow, you described it as the miracle grow of the brain. It's been described as such. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By someone else, maybe not you. Yeah. But uh, it makes uh, neurons grow, and it yep. uh, effectively allows neurons to um, become more neuroplastic. Yep. It promotes neurogenesis or growth of new neurons. Uh, particularly in the hippocampus, particularly in the dented gyrus area of the hippocampus, Mm -hmm. which is involved with formation of new memory. Um, Yeah, formation of new memory. I'm trying to think. The hippocampus is kind of, yeah, it's your, I suppose, decoding area. So your visual field, obviously, you take it and goes to your visual cortex. Then it gets sent to the hippocampus. There it gets kind of coded and then sent back for storage, Mm -hmm. right? If you want recall, then it comes back through the hippocampus and back out, right? So, and that's kind of how how it works. So, I mean, as soon as your hippocampus starts breaking down, you can't make new memories. You've stored old memories and you have a way to recall them, but they tend to be jumbled. And I mean, that's what happens with somebody who's got Alzheimer's, for example, or dementia. If you've lost large portions of the hippocampus, you'll still be able to recall stuff that happened years ago but you won't remember how you walked around the block, if you know what I mean, Mm -hmm. right? So anyway, going back to the hippocampus, yeah, BDNF promotes neurogenesis quite, I'm not going to say specifically within the hippocampus, but it does do so uh, efficiently within the hippocampus, Mm -hmm. right? So hence promotes formation of new memories. Again, the studies done on this, as I mentioned, in relation to exercise tend to be involving um, an older population, again, as an intervention towards dementia. So what they found is that as you age, your hippocampal volume goes down. So if volume within the brain is going down, that means you're losing neurons. If you lose neurons, you mean it loses the ability to form new memories. Mm -hmm. So as I said, BDNF can promote neurogenesis. So what they found is that actually, yes, BDNF also decreases as you get older. So if you increase BDNF, can you reverse that hippocampal volume loss can you reverse um, the cell loss and indeed it has been shown that you do so how do you increase BDNF you exercise okay. it goes up quite um, efficiently by exercising to be honest and it seems like it's almost twofold that it is releasing this BDNF yep. but also that exercise is just simply increasing blood flow to the brain and that, there's also that factor too mm-hmm. yeah you kind of get into a slightly different aspect to this um, yeah, you, you increase vascularization. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, exercise will increase growth hormone, which will increase the release of IGF-1, which will increase vascularization in the brain. Again, there's links between IGF-1 and BDNF. I can't remember specifics. Uh-huh. It's years Come since on, I God studied it. <laughs> years <kidding>. since <laughs> I studied it. But yeah, there are... I mean, it's not, it, it, it's not to say that exercise just does one thing. That's the, the effect, right? It, it can... It affects a multitude of different molecules that all of interacting mm-hmm. um, or an interplay between them to have all potential benefits. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. There's obviously negative side effects to exercise too, depending on how much you do. Yeah. So I did. I gave a talk on that as well at one point. But it, oh. can, it can negatively affect your heart. Well, but, I'm looking forward but, looking forward to that uh, kind of exercise, the negative impacts of exercise, and maybe when it's going to be too much, maybe that'll be for the comeback episode that you do. Um, <laughs> but you kind of alluded to, you know, we, when we think about exercise, it has so many benefits outside yeah. of just kind of learning and memory. And that brings yeah. me to sort of like my next point is that uh, you talked about in your lecture 
how acute long distance running reduces anxiety and pain. And there's an increase in the anandamide in the hippocampus, which is um, in response to an increase in phys- physical stress versus a, psycho- a decrease in psychological stress. Yeah, that, again, that's kind of more, that was what I mentioned about the mouse studies. Mm-hmm. That's how they measured, I suppose, f- they had fear conditioned mice. Okay. Um, I can't remember the specifics of what they do with this. Sometimes you use a hot plate or an electric shock plate okay. to trigger anxiety. I mean, if they get shocked and they know that they're going to get shocked, they're going to have an anxiety response. Um, so yeah, that was essentially reduced by the mice that are that exercise. And what they usually do, the protocol for exercising mice or rats is either put them on a treadmill or you put them on a. They they like to run. So you put them in a freewheel, or you put a freewheel in their cage, and you can mm-hmm. measure how much they actually run on it. So yeah, and they found that it did reduce anxiety in the mice. And again, that was kind of what I was saying about how you can equate that to the runner's high in in humans. It's not exactly the same thing, but it does in humans. It's also been shown to reduce anxiety. Again, this is just um, survey longitudinal studies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. So, I mean, are there any really clear, understood benefits on behavior from exercise? Um, do you d- define behaviors? I'm just almost thinking, like, you know, when I'm potentially a psychiatrist one day, yeah. uh, someone comes in who's been dealing with severe depression and anxiety. How could you start them on an exercise program to kind of achieve, like, this runner's high to oh. sort of kind of get these benefits? Start slow. <laughs> All, always start slow. No, seriously, it, like that's the thing. Everybody thinks that you have to jump in and I have to start training for a marathon and stuff. No, not at all. Like it starts with just going for a walk. I mean, w- one of the studies uh, that found this fairly significant increase in BDNF, for example, in an elderly population was this longitudinal study that took place over the course of a year. And what they did was they looked at in- individuals, they put them on a treadmill, just walking for 40 minutes three times a week. And that they found that those in the walking group actually maintained, over the course of the year, maintained BDNF levels, whereas those in the non-walking group, it reduced, as you would expect, as people aged, right? So, kind of going back to your uh, uh, people with psychological problems, again, or trying to get them to exercise, again, it's just start work by walking. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be super intense. Again, people who haven't done exercise for quite a while, their VO2 max is going to be quite low, so fitness levels are low, Mm -hmm. right? So one of the things that people have found is that if you exercise, you have to exercise at a certain level. So if you're just going for a walk and your VO2 max happens to be 70 mils per minute per kg, you're not going to really be exercising at a significant level to make any sort of a difference. However, if your VO2 max is quite low at 23, 24, then just going for a walk, you'll be at about what you'd consider 60%, which is kind of the magic number. You have to achieve about 60 to 70% to have any sort of, not any sort of benefit, but to have I suppose the BDNF effect, so to have the cognitive effect, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it Im- improves cognitive scores, improves executive function, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, and then I guess my question then, you know, you are a big endurance athlete. Uh, I am certainly not uh, that I'm kind not, of person. Well, either I, way, not for instance, uh, you went for, you mentioned a 10 mile run on Sunday. Yeah. Um, I went for a four mile run, and that was like the extent of my long distance kind of running. So, is there really a tolerance though to producing endocannabinoids like when we both did that series of exercise were we essentially producing the same amount of endocannabinoids because you're used to that 10 mile run well, and I'm used to that 4 miles like yeah, how does that work again, or were you more runners high than me kind of no not necessarily so there's a, there's a as I did mention I think the studies show that you, it has to be there's a time kind of if you do less than 20 to 30 minutes it's not achievable um after that it varies it's not always a guaranteed thing either but of the benefit it's not if we move on from the runner's high and say we increase bdnf and have the the cognitive benefit right um you're really talking about exercising at somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of your vo2 max Mm -hmm. so again depending on how trained you are your vo2 max will increase with training so and that's why say i do 10 miles and you do four Mm -hmm. 
if you've got a lower VO2 max than me, you'll still be working at 60%, give or take 60, 75%, okay. percent, right? So yeah, the magic number seems to be between 60 and 70, okay. give or take. So but that's not to say the 72 you know, in, in is like a benefit, it is. Yeah, in this older population, <coughs> or kind of to the maybe potential patient we were alluding to earlier, someone who's brand new to exercise, like how do they even know what that 60 to 70% range is? Like how do you figure that out personally? Well, you kind of estimate it based on your max heart rate, right? Mm -hmm. So your max heart rate, theoretical max heart rate is 220, right? Your personal max heart rate is 220 minus your age. Again, this is a theoretical number because it will vary slightly depending on how trained you are. Okay. So, and you can work out your max heart rate and you can kind of go off a percentage of max heart rate. And if you're working at about 70% of your max heart rate, and it's easy enough to do. One of the, the easier ways to, to kind of remember this stuff is that <clears throat> if you're walking and you can maintain a conversation, you're, you're, going, you're going to be 50 to 60 percent. If you're kind of working slightly above that, where you can still maintain a conversation, but you can't sing, um, that's kind of about the right spot, I okay. suppose. Does that make sense where you can still make, maintain? There's, been, there's people who looked at this and kind of worked out how many words you can say. Interesting, <laughs> okay. Per minute. Yeah. To work at a certain level. Again, it's going to be based on individuals' training levels. But yeah, as long as you can... I, we used to say this about fat burning versus, CO, or versus carbohydrate as well. So if you can still maintain a conversation, but you couldn't sing, that's probably about right. Okay. Well, that's a good good I'll show goal. you a graph on that actually yeah that's interesting so well and actually I was watching a TED talk this morning um, about kind of the endocannabinoid system and they said how exercise is one of the things that can release endocannabinoids in your body uh, but yep. also singing and dancing maybe just oh, yeah. that exercise and oh yeah happiness. No, I mean this is something you mentioned okay it's a slightly different graph but this mm -hmm. is about um, f fat the rate at which you burn fat versus CO2 is or carbohydrates use CHO so here you can see at about the 60% uh, give or take, you've kind of achieved a medium between you're burning 50% okay. fat, 50% carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of about the range where you can still talk, but you wouldn't be able to sing. And as soon as you go above that, you're going to start burning more carbohydrate. But again, slightly different topic, okay. but yeah. yeah. Well, so again, it's kind of that, that key area where you're also going to be increasing anandamide, which increases BDNF. There's also another molecule that came out recently as well, called irisin, irisin which is which is okay. muscle based so it's produced by the muscles in response to exercise um and yeah it has again this was kind of controversial for quite a while because it was found in mice in 2012 but it hasn't been shown in humans up until last year i think okay. maybe last year year before so yeah it's been shown to increase in response to exercise and actually also increases bdnf oh, so wow. there's, there's a few different things that increase bdnf and as i said bdnf seems to be the molecule that as you called it Miracle growth for the brain. The miracle growth, yes. So that's the one that you should really focus on, I think. So anything that can increase BDNF, so whatever byproduct as a result of exercise is increasing that's causing an increase in BDNF is what people need to focus on, I think. And that's yeah. the one that increases neurogenesis, um, has positive benefits to long term potentiation, which is the biological form of learning and memory. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's where it's at and as I said the kind of key area for that in terms of exercise is to exercise between about 60 to 70 percent of your vo2 max yeah for about 40 minutes 30 40 minutes you will get benefit for shorter periods of time as I said again all of these studies I'm talking about are all what you consider chronic studies so they're long term okay I mentioned earlier and you, you mentioned as well about kids in school yeah they're short-term acute bouts of exercise and there still is benefit to that mm -hmm. again it's acute so the benefits acute so the benefit, it, it, it's still longer lived than the bout of exercise that you actually do, which is still pretty cool. So what if someone who's listening, uh, you know, they're all excited about, they can potentially release more BDNF in their body yep. and, you know, improve their brain in some capacity, but they absolutely hate that kind of uh, steady state cardiovascular exercise. Yep. So are there... You know, resistance training or high yeah. intensity interval training, yoga or anything else that yeah, can have these there's same benefits? Been, yes. Yoga does, um, kind of through a different mechanism, I think. Again, I haven't done a huge amount of research on it because I'm more of the endurance You're not a yogi? type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do more endurance stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, there's been some studies, not as many studies done on resistance training. Mm -hmm. 
part of the reason for that is that it's hard to do resistance training with mice and rats, yeah. which is your model, right? Yeah. So, and it's been done a couple of times. So you obviously put weights on a mouse on a treadmill, but then are you triggering anxiety because they feel stressed about it? They've done it with ladder climbs where they attach weights onto their tail. Um, and they have found that there is benefits. There was a study done in humans where they coupled an endurance or an aerobic exercise program with uh, a weights program and they found that there was additional benefit to doing weights okay. in, in terms of cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. So and again we can equate a cognitive ability to increase BDNF. If you will, it's a little bit more complicated but you know, for the most part we will for today. Um, yeah, and they found that yeah, there was additional benefits, increased cognitive function and so on. Again, most of the studies, as I said, in humans have been done in an aged population. Yeah. Where you're already seeing cognitive decline, you see hippocamp hippocampal volume decreases and so on. So So on this show, I'm a big advocate of meditation. And okay. it's helped me a lot with my personal management of bipolar disorder. Um, but whenever I talk about meditation, especially to someone who's never meditated before, it sounds like the world's worst idea in the world. But I always equate how, you know, meditation doesn't have to be you sitting in a room listening to like yogi music yep. and, you know, with your legs crossed and stuff like that. Going on a long run or yep. a bike ride or whatever it may be is kind of like a state of meditation in itself that you're yeah. not thinking really about anything else in that moment. Yep. So are any of these potential benefits we're seeing from that maybe flow state of mind, that meditative state? I would think so. Exercise. Yeah, I, I d again, I, I don't personally meditate. I, if, well, depending on how you, you want to define it. I mean, mm -hmm. I do go for a long run where I zone out. Um, yeah, I, I would I would think there's a lot of the similar benefits, to be honest. Again, I'm not sure about the studies that have been done on it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Yeah. My so more research needs to be done, essentially. Uh, there's always more research needs to be done on, on all of this. But, yeah, my guess is that it's very similar mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Um I'm not sure. I think there's a decent amount on meditation, but I've never looked into it. Okay. Okay. So, but my guess is, yeah, you're pretty correct. Well, so, and uh, how I want to kind of finish this talk is, I remember I, I attended your lecture last year, and I was just so excited yeah. because I want to go into, obviously, psychiatry, so this is really right up my alley. But most specifically, I might want to work with uh, addiction population. Okay. And so I was thinking a lot about how the positives and negative negative side of yep. this this research so I guess let's start out with you know if someone who is consuming a cannabis product yep. uh, like legally here like in the yep. state of Washington how is this potentially impacting this endocannabinoid system that is responding from exercise I my guess is it'll compete with the, the receptors for binding mm -hmm. however just to go back up a little bit there has been some studies done on the effect I should say that uh, cannabis THC is technically on the water banned substance list mm -hmm. aside from obviously being federally illegal um, so there has been some studies done on the effect of THC on exercise whether there's benefits or negative connotations to it mm -hmm. and what they've found is that there was reduced this was kind of interesting that there was a reduced probability of developing exercise induced asthma oh okay however there was no other benefits as such, okay. okay? So whether it was competing, again, I'm unsure about the binding specifics of anandamide versus THC, whether they compete for the same receptor, because mm -hmm. there is a couple of receptors, CB1, CB2, whether they compete for the same one or whether they, they have separate receptors. Again, I'm not s specific on that, but um, there's potential that it could compete, but I don't think THC has any negative or positive benefits to exercise mm -hmm. um, CBD is slightly different CBD is coming to vogue I suppose in the endurance community as a uh, recovery to take post po take on recovery post um, post exercise in particular on longer runs days where you're gonna you know you're gonna be pretty poor the next day mm -hmm. so like I, I think this weekend I have to do about an 18 mile on a Sunday so for me, it would be advisable to take CBD if I if I would, um, but apparently, yeah, there is benefits. However, research on it is very scant. So I, I checked it, into that, and we you I remember you mentioned that CBD is kind of an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So whether the benefits are anti-inflammatory or whether they are central, it, it's hard to know. Um, again, you're trying to get, you can get kind of into the neurotransmitters effect on this. Mm -hmm. 
So exercise increases serotonin. It alters how serotonin is regulated afterwards, but it increases serotonin initially, um, and it increases dopamine, which dopamine kind of gives you the feeling of euphoria. Serotonin enhances mood, right? So dopamine tends to stay higher for longer when you exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, That also, over a longer period of time, for endurance athletes, the higher your dopamine levels over a period of time, the more likely you are to continue and less likely you are to quit. Okay, serotonin doesn't necessarily have a huge amount to do with that. But yeah, I'm not sure as to how they alter your neurotransmitter balance. Okay. So. And is it possible that that, uh, the endocannabinoid, the anatomide, also has an anti-inflammatory component to it? Okay, so they kind of act similarly? Yeah, there is. Part of the reason I was interested in this uh, to begin with was that Years ago, you never started with this, but I used to work in uh, neuroinflammation. So in the lab next door, we had two labs next door. One of them worked on exercise in the brain, and we used to collaborate with them. And then the lab at the other side, <coughs> they used to do cannabinoids. So yeah, we did look at, they looked at anandamide at one point, and there is an anti-inflammatory effect to it. Okay. So it downregulates microglial activation, which are immune cells in the, in the brain. They pump it out a ton of pro-inflammatory cytokines when they get stressed. So I think Ananda might reverse that. Um, so yeah, there is an anti-inflammatory effect. That's centrally, peripherally. I'm guessing that there is as well. Yeah. It does very similar things to, to macrophages, for example. But yeah. So before I uh, you know, came to here, Pacific Northwest University, I was living out in Connecticut working at an addiction center. And so I remember when you gave this talk, it gave me all these ideas on things that I could have said if I could go back in time. And I was working in essentially a halfway house with a group of about 25 indi- uh, male individuals who were all you know, trying to recover yep. from addiction. And I would always try to probe these guys to go exercise more. But in that state of uh, my life, I didn't have the scientific wherewithal to yep. really explain kind of the benefits. And so I would love to go back now and kind of talk about how you know, you can essentially grow your BDNFF, grow your brain, um, which I don't know if they'd be that interested in, but at least the second part of it, like you can feel this sense of high from exercising. Yeah. So I guess though, how does that... Well, you get people who are addicted to it. Yeah, certainly. And that that can be a bad thing in itself, I guess. Yeah, but there's pros and cons. I think there's two aspects to that, right? There Mm -hmm. there is the genuine, genuine runner's high feeling that people get from exercising, but there's also the sense of involvement and community, Mm -hmm. right? So... I've never done CrossFit, but if you know, CrossFit is a huge community, right? Yeah. So, and there's a sense of what do you, you know, CrossFitters, they stick together, they all have the same outlook on things, you know, very into the paleo diet, that kind of stuff. And I, I think there's benefit from both aspects to it. Um, and I think there, there's, it's not to underestimate the aspect of community within a sport as well. Mm-hmm. So, there's massive benefits to that. And then how does, you know, that uh, individual who was dealing with marijuana addiction for years, how does that kind of high compare to like a runner's kind of high? Or do we really know? I can't give you an honest answer on okay. that because I've never experienced it. Yeah. Because, <laughs> so. you know, I would always, I, when I would work at that addiction center, it would always... These individuals would talk about how they longed for the good sides of the drug, you yep. know, the, those highs, but they, of course, didn't want any of the bad sides. Yeah, you hear the same with alcohol. And too. Yeah, exactly. And then they would also, I would say, I'm not here to treat your addiction. I just want to try to get you addicted to something that's healthy kind of thing, like exercise. And yep. so, I mean, I would love to kind of continue with this research and almost use it in my future yep. psychiatric practice uh, to try to hopefully benefit you know, my patients. Yeah. So this BDNF, BDNF, this kind of miracle grow for the brain, does it, you know, for an individual who consumed opiates for years or really any kind of meth- methamphetamines, any other drugs that's really shrinking their brain and destroying a lot of their brains, have there been any studies on how that factor can help the, out the, that population? I have no idea. Okay. That's okay. a good question. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that is a good question. I have no clue. Okay. There has there. I can't remember his name now. No, I was thinking of something different. I was going to say there was a guy who was he most likely did, but I know he was. I, I was thinking of a guy. He's a really good triathlete, long distance triathlete. He was in prison for armed robbery for I think it was ten years. He came out and he just literally turned his life around. Got addicted to long distance exercise and stuff like that. But yeah, there you go. 
Like, well, and then uh, I guess let's finish on the one last thing we were talking about kind of before the podcast. Um, and actually, I had kind of that same thought when I was, you know, I've seen psychiatrists for freaking seven years now. And it's always in a room rather than this. And this is still an enjoyable room. Oh, yeah. But what might be a better experience <laughs> yeah, might be a better experience is going on a walk and like oh, yeah, having absolutely. this conversation. Yeah, so, I've read that a few times. Yeah. Can you that, talk a little yeah, bit about that research? Yeah, just changing the paradigm. Yeah. It, it, I don't know whether it's been researched. I mean, it was just, I read it couple of years ago now as a kind of an anecdotal you know maybe people in the future as part of your doctor's visit as opposed to just sitting in a chair and explaining your symptoms just why don't you walk around and explain your symptoms I know that's not feasible for absolutely everybody Mm -hmm. but you know for you and me it's easy to go outside there's the added benefit of being outside and again studies have shown that if you're outside you're happier than if you are inside again going back to to exercise and people have asked me in the past, where should I run? Is it better to run on a treadmill or go outside? Every time, if you can, go outside. Yeah. You know, there's benefits to seeing trees and stuff. I know that sounds a bit kind of hippie-ish, but... I mean, but it makes gen- total genuinely sense. Genuinely, there yeah. is. Yeah, there is. Everybody, people don't appreciate it as much, but if you get outside and you're in nature, you generally feel happier. Yeah. So. Well, I actually, I just gave a talk on campus yesterday, uh, experiencing psychosis, it was called, and I talked a lot about uh, my experience in the psych ward and then also my medication yeah. regimen, but really my biggest complaint of the psych ward was, one, it was a locked facility that was yeah. terrible, but also there was no access to any exercise, and so I remember I was doing like push-ups in my room and just walking the hallways, and so really my dream as a future psychiatrist is I want to put in some means of like a treadmill or a stationary bike or maybe yeah weights whatever we can put safely in there that can help my patients just kind of come down from that anxious state of mind or that psychotic break they might have had yeah did you ever see old movies uh old post-world war one movies can't say that i have too much okay well every time they take uh patients with shell shock which Mm -hmm. would be ptsd they'd put them in this old English estate. Well, that's what they did in the movies. Mm -hmm. But these English estates had these expansive gardens and people would be outside roaming the grounds and stuff like that. Apparently, there was benefits. Yeah, I'm sure. Maybe that exercise released an anamide and BDNF, (laughs) and that was our recovery right there. Well, uh, Dr. Lyons, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, no worries. Super, super fun. Um, I'll put the intro on uh, retrospectively, but yeah, this has been so cool, and I hope you're open to doing it again. Yeah, yeah, no worries. It's cool. All right, awesome, man.